Good morning. Um, we actually have a, a couple of Ask the Pastor questions uh, that I've, I've kind of been holding on to for a couple weeks. I'm going to do one today and one next week. Um, the question is, uh, if God is all-knowing, then why is there a constant battle between God and Satan if God already knows if you're going to heaven or hell? First, we need to understand God is not battling Satan. Okay, Satan's already been defeated. It's no contest. Okay, uh, Satan showed up and realized he got the loser's prize. Um, when God has set his will, who can thwart it? Who can reject it? Who can deny it? No one. Okay, so when God has established something, Satan... He just has to accept it. That's the way that it is. Okay? Now, we understand that there is a battle going on, but it's not between God and the devil. Okay? It's us. All right? It's really the, the, the battle that's going on is the, the flesh, the carnal nature, that this, this thing that we've been born into, the sin... And the Spirit of God that is trying to birth in us a Christ-likeness. Now, um, does God know everything? Absolutely. God always knows everything. Okay? Way back when he decided to make all that we know and see, he knew I would be standing here today saying this. I'm not surprising God. Okay? Um, <laughs> he knew I was going to do that. <laughs> all right? Nothing shocks him because he already knows. All right? And, and this question kind of uh, edges on predestination, and, and that's actually a subject for a different time. Um, God works on our behalf to accomplish his purposes. Okay? We're tools. Every single one of us is a tool. Every person ever was, is, or will be is a tool. All right? Sometimes they are being used of God. Sometimes they are being directly used of Satan. This garbage that happened in Paris. Happened in Paris. Okay? Now, you think that surprised God? God went, oh my gosh, they're in Paris. No. He knew. All right? Um, why does God allow some of these things to happen? I, I don't know. He, he, I'm not wise enough, smart enough, intellectual enough to understand God, okay? But I know nothing moves outside of his will. You know how I know? Because he tells me. He desires, and that's different from will. When he wills, it happens. He desires things. He desires that all of us would come to know him. He desires that all mankind would be saved, Okay? This is that whole thing with why in the world did God put the apple in the garden or the pomegranate or the mango or whatever the fruit was? You, you know what I think? I think it was a star fruit. I got to taste my first one in, in Israel and it was incredible. But boy, if sin ever tasted like anything, it was probably that. <laughs> okay? And, and, but using that logic somehow or another in a twisted way, that would mean onions are godly, right? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so let's let's kind of look at this a little bit, all right? Um, first, we are, I, I just said we're, we're tools of God. You understand that the sinners, those that are not saved, are also tools of God. Do you understand that they move according to His purposes and His plans? They are as confined and constrained to that as we are by choice. We choose to allow God to move in us, but they, they don't choose that. He just uses them. It, it's, it's like a chessboard. This pawn may say, ah, I'm going to go over here. But it's God that moves them. It's God that puts it in their heart to do that. Look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Look at Cyrus. Look at all of these things throughout Scripture that God said, this is going to happen. I have caused and purposes to happen. It will happen. 
This is part of what makes me so confident in the things that I'm looking forward to. The things that not, have not yet happened will happen. Why? Because the things that he said would happen, happened. He said, a virgin will conceive. He said, the baby would be born in Bethlehem. He said, that child would go to Egypt and come out of Egypt. He said that child would grow up in Nazareth. Okay? All of these things he said would happen, happen. Now, just using our logic, <coughs> can a virgin conceive? Ah. So when he writes that, I mean, you've got to think, all right, God, how are you going to do this? I mean, you parted the waters, you led us through. You drove out the inhabitants of Canaan before us, but a virgin conceived? I would have been hesitant to write that. God, are you sure? Can I leave my name off this one? You know? But God says it, it will happen. So this, this battle that has taken place is not between God and the devil. They're not waging war to see who's going to win. God is omnipotent. God is sovereign. Satan himself is constrained to God's will. Look at the book of Job. Job comes before God and God says, What are you doing? Oh, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. God, God says, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? I, I, I struggle with this idea. Because part of me really wants to be somebody that God would say, Have you considered my servant Glenn? And the other part of me says, please don't. <laughs> and come on, you do too. Because we see what happened to Job. And, and, and Satan says, well, yeah, of course he honors you. You blessed him with everything. I'm not allowed to touch him. God says, okay. Up to himself. You can, you can touch everything else, but leave him alone. So Satan goes out and he takes his children he takes all his livestock, he takes his wealth, and, and, and yet Job still praises God. So, so Satan comes back into the presence of God. You gotta think he's coming to eat crow, because he tried to prove his point and God proved him wrong. And, and he comes before him and he says, well, Satan, where have you been? Oh, I've been going back and forth. So what about Job? He says, well, yeah, of course. You let me take all his stuff, but he's still healthy. All right, up to his life. You may take. And he's afflicted. Now, I've never had a boil. I've seen people that have boils. I don't want them. Okay? And, and yet he was head to toe covered in boils. And even his wife tells him, curse God and die. You got, Thanks, love. <laughs> yeah, I, well, this is the first time you see her. Job, just curse God and get it over with. God set the boundary for Satan. He does that in each one of our lives. And he says you can come this far and no further. Sometimes he comes really close, doesn't he? And other times he's held off at a distance. Have you ever had a time where you, just, you were just tired? You were just beat up? And God said, you know what? Leave her alone. Leave him alone. Right now, I'm going to deal with them. They need my administration. You back off. And then in that moment, God comes and he settles on you. And you feel the, the restoration of your spirit, your soul. You feel yourself being revitalized. You, you, you feel a personal revival. Because God has allowed you to come to that point, and that's usually the point where we do what? We fall down on our face and we call out to him. God, help me. And then he says, all right, Satan, enough. Back off. Okay? So this struggle is not between Satan and God. God's already won. God had never lost his authority he always had it. He always will. Okay? So what, what is this, you know, if, if God's all-knowing? Um, I know there are different 
aspects of theology, my, my personal answer is uh, God allows us to be stupid. Okay? He allows us to do things outside of, outside of his desire for us. God desires good for us, doesn't he? Isn't that what scripture says? My plans for you are good. I, I, I want good for you. I mean, the, the whole point of Christ coming to the cross is so that ultimately, in eternity, we have good. Right? Okay? So, if he wants good for us, why does bad happen to us? Because one of two reasons. One, we're stupid, and we, we keep pushing the bubble, keep pushing the bubble, and God says, fine, you want it? Take it. And then you pick up that poison apple and go, ooh! Okay? Or, and, and I really think both of, this is, both of these are just the one reason. God uses it to grow us, to, to mature us, to get us out of that um, attitude of self that we tend to have. Um, there was a, a toddler who is distantly related to me this morning, and, and nothing like his grandfather, and, and he was having a little bit of an attitude problem, okay? And mom and dad stepped in, and he got chastised. Now, I guarantee you, what he thought worth was worth throwing an attitude about, he didn't think was worth in light of getting a swat upside the rump. He, it caused him to rethink what he thought was good. A lot of times that's us. God says, stop. I'm going to do it. Stop. I'm doing it. What? Ow! Why would you smack me? God, why would you do that? I told you to stop. Okay? Uh, you know, some of us... God speaks to him very kindly. I love the way God speaks to my wife. Because she listens. <laughs> and he says, Christy, you need to not do that. She says, okay, God. And he says, Glenn, don't do that. What? <laughs> Glenn, don't do that. This? Glenn, boy, I'm going to pop you upside the head if you don't stop. Wow, man, you don't need to get mad. <laughs> I'll stop. Okay? So some of us, we need the gentle encouragement. Some of us need the stick-up side. Okay? So it's not a contest between God and the devil. It's God growing us as Christians. It's God growing us, maturing us, developing in us the fruit of the Spirit and getting rid of all of the acts of the, the sinful nature, the, the flesh, the ick. It's getting rid of all of that and replacing it with, with good stuff so that we become Christ-like. Okay? We, we don't want to be self-like because there's not a, like, a lot to like about self. We want to be Christ-like. Okay? So, um, the answer is up here on the table for the one that asked that question. I've, I've given some scriptures and some other things to, to look at. Um, we are in the Thanksgiving season. Um, not Christmas yet. Okay? Let's, let's take these one at a time and fully enjoy the one we're in before we move on. I mean, the, the way we're doing this, we're going to see Fourth of July fireworks up the day after Christmas. Very close. Thank you for disappointing my whole holiday season. Okay? We're in the Thanksgiving season. And, and I talked a little bit last week uh, about some examples uh, from the book of Psalms of, of people that had reason to give thanks and, and the, the scenario that they were in. Things that had happened, some they chose of their own willfulness and their own sin. Others, just life happens. And, and in each case, when they called out to God, he delivered them. And what was their response? Say it loud. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. It's, not, it's not a trick question. We're, we're in the Thanksgiving season, so there's kind of a flow here. Okay. When, when God delivered them, their response was to give thanks. Now, I started counting every kind of thanksgiving that I could see in Scripture. All right? I, I counted thanks, gratitude, uh, thanksgiving, thankfulness, uh, and I came up with 107. Okay? And then I went and I checked online. I missed a lot. Okay? Um, depending on your translation, depending on how the words are used, um, the NASB, which I, I like for things of this 
purpose. I think it is the best word-for-word -word translation out there. Okay? Uh, personally, I don't like the way it reads. Okay? Because they're doing a word-for-word -word translation and the, the syntax and things don't carry over to the English very well, sometimes it's kind of hard to read. You're, you're looking at an article and you're trying to figure out, does that apply here or does that apply there? Okay? And unless you're a Greek or Hebrew scholar, it's kind of hard to read. So I like the NASB for study, and I really recommend it. If you don't have one, get one. Okay? Use that to study by. I like the ESV because it, it takes those things, and the Greek and the Hebrew scholars look at that in light of the English language and say, well, we know according to the Greek that it has to apply to this. So they make it so in, in the translation. But, but for counting the words that are directly translated, NASB is by far the best way to go. Unless, of course, you can read the Greek and the Hebrew. So, um, so 169 times we are told either to give thanks or we are shown someone actually being thankful. 169 times. How many books are in the Bible? 66. So how many times does that work out to in each book? Two and a half. Two and a half. Just over two and a half. Okay? Um, well, we're going to throw a curve because the book of Colossians hogs a lot of them and it covers seven. Seven times in the, the book of Colossians, the word or the idea, the concept of Thanksgiving is, is given. Now, we actually have uh, a couple of different Greek words that are being used. Um, the, the one that is primarily used is um, Eucharisto, which we get the word Eucharist from. Does anybody know what the Eucharist is? Okay, we have a lot of former Catholics in here. What is the Eucharist? I'll give you a hint. It's communion. <laughs> so what's Eucharist? <coughs> communion. Okay, so we had, okay, a lot of you have never been in the Catholic Church. The, the communion service is also called Eucharist, okay? And the idea is in 1 Corinthians um, 11, when Jesus is, or Paul is talking about Jesus doing the Last Supper, and he says, giving thanks, that's Eucharisto, okay? And the idea for that is, is simply to give thanks, okay? You don't, you don't have to break it apart and add to it and twist it and, and parse it. And it, it just means, you know, I'm, I'm giving thanks, okay? Um, there is also uh, uh, homologio, which also has exologio in it, but the idea is to <coughs> proclaim and to speak forth thanks. Okay? So the one is just the nature of, of thanksgiving, that's something that is inside, both here and here, and the other is birthing it out. Okay? And, and, and that kind of covers two entirely different things. First, we're giving thanks to God. We, we are actually honoring Him for all kinds of things. And we're, we're going to talk about what in a minute. All right? But if we are um, speaking forth thanks, it's got to be here first. Okay? Now, we, it's a process we learn going back to that same whatever person's grandson, there's a process that they have to learn to say thank you, okay? And, and sometimes it's a difficult process because mine, 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 mine. I don't care if it was yours, it is mine. I don't care if it's in your hand, it's mine. And then when you give it to them, you are just setting things right in their world. You're the one that messed it up, now you're fixing it. You should thank them. Okay? But then we do, we do this whole thing of, now you have to say thank you. Why? You, you say thank you. You ain't eating that until you say thank you. And this is how it works, folks. Grandpa got all kinds of sticky hands. Say thank you. Guess what? You ain't getting it because I can't get it off my feet. <laughs> okay? And then they start learning, oh, if I say thank you, I get mine. And then they, they kind of learn. They come walking up, thank you. <laughs> no, this is mine. Go away. 
son, your son needs you. <laughs> but there's an idea, there's a practice, there's a discipline that goes into learning to be thankful, isn't there? And this is the idea that I really want to kind of draw out today. The, the, the first word, the Eucharisto, is this is the nature of who you are. Okay? Being thankful. 1 Thessalonians tells us. Let's, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. <clears throat> I'm sorry, chapter 5. Now, one of the things that I really appreciate about God's Word is a lot of God's Word doesn't leave room for doubt. It doesn't leave room for us to question, okay? I really like this in Paul, a lot of Paul's writings. I really like it in James. There's no question with James. James makes things very clear, okay? John tends to have the same thing, but I, 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 want, I say that because I want to start off um, we're going to start off in verse 15. Actually, we'll back up to 14. Okay? Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. So, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Boy, we could spend weeks on just that, couldn't we? See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. We could spend more weeks on just that. Okay? And then in verse 16, rejoice always. How often do we, we rejoice? Always. Is there any doubt as to how often we should rejoice here? He, he's, pretty, he's putting it pretty blunt. He doesn't say... Well, rejoice in these kinds of circumstances, and then the other ones you get a buy. <clears throat> he doesn't equivocate at all. He just says rejoice always. Okay? One of the things that I have to learn, because I have to confess, by nature, I tend to be uh, pessimistic. Okay? Um, that's what my wife says, that I am. I, I think I just tend to be the realist, okay? And, and you know, they say, well, you know, a, a optimist sees a glass half full, and a pessimist sees it's half empty. I don't want water. <laughs> okay, so, um, God has really been working on me to kind of change the natural bent that I've had and, and that I, I kind of grew up with. And rejoicing always is one of those things when things start to go sideways, it's one of the things we least feel like doing. And when things start getting rough and, and, and difficult, we don't want to rejoice. But that's the time we need to do it most, okay? Um, we have had, I'll tell you, two of the most hectic weeks in a long, long time. There are a lot of things going on within the body here at Jesus Community Church. And um, a lot of it not very good if we don't trust God. And when bad reports come, we, we don't want to rejoice. And, and one of the first things that I tell people when, when bad things come, and I'm learning to do this, is when I feel my attitude start to dip, or, or I receive a bad report, I turn on praise music, okay? And I, I play it, and I, I put my earbuds in, and I, or I pop it, I, I don't have a, a, an awful lot of choice in my house anyway, because Christy always has praise music playing on her phone everywhere she goes. And sometimes I don't hear the praise music and I'm like, where's the praise music? And she's walking around with earbuds in. Hey! Selfish! 
But if we start to hear that praise and we let that soak into us, then we, we find ourselves starting to rejoice almost without thinking. Because we start singing those songs and all of a sudden we find that the spirit lifts, okay? So rejoice always, okay? Um, pray without ceasing. So when do you stop praying? Never. Never. See, see Paul is not putting measures on these things, okay? So we pray without ceasing. Don't stop. And this is, you know, I, I've heard actually a number of sermons on this and how you do this. Really, I, I think what it is, is it's cultivating a ongoing, an ongoing communication with God. We're just talking with Him all the time. And it, it's amazing because you don't need anything to communicate with Him. Okay? I have a certain spot in my house that I go when I, I when I'm in my red chair, everybody knows, leave them alone. Okay? When I sit in the red chair, and when, if you come to my house and you look at the red chair and you see it facing the wall, there's a reason for that. And so I don't see all the stuff going on around me. I can be quiet before God. I can pray. I can worship. I can get alone with God. That that red chair is my prayer closet. Okay? And and we each have an area in our house where we pray. And sometimes it changes. I mean, Thaddeus actually has a closet that he goes into. And looking around, I told him to take out the trash. Where is that kid? Oh, he's praying. Sorry, God. When, when he's done, would you remind him to take out the trash? Okay. But that's, that's not what this is talking about. I don't spend all of my day in the red chair because then I wouldn't be any good in the practical things that the kingdom needs done. Okay? So there's this, this idea that you're just constantly in communication with God. And there are some times when uh, Christian and I were driving up to Missoula yesterday. You know you have a very comfortable relationship with someone when you can drive the entire way in silence and not worry about whether or not they're mad at you. You know everything's okay. Okay? And, and occasionally she'd look over and she'd say, well, what are you thinking about? And i go, I don't want to tell you, because I think really weird stuff. <laughs> and she makes fun of me. <laughs> and, and then I'll say, well, what are you thinking about? She said, I was just enjoying the mountain over there. <laughs> yeah, I, now that's what I'm thinking about, that mountain over there. <laughs> Okay, so, but there's this idea that, that you know, there's constant communication going on with God. And, and, and in a relationship, the more intimate that the relationship is, the less that you actually really have to say. Sometimes it's just enjoying being with them. Okay, so pray without ceasing. And then this last one, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I know, uh, you know, especially with the stuff that's been going on the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of circumstances that really uh, challenge this verse. How do I give thanks in this? Because we're giving thanks to the God that is far beyond our present circumstance. Okay? Now, We've seen some, some incredible things done in this church. God has moved his hand. We've seen people that uh, were, were dealing with cancer, and God has, has put their hand on them, whether through um, the, the, the procedures that the doctors do or through just miraculously touching them. We've seen healthy babies born. We've seen an incredible testimony of a, a pregnancy and a baby that was born and immediately graduated to heaven. Okay? And, and how do we give thanks in those things? Because it's not based on the circumstance. It's based on the God that is holding us through that circumstance. Okay? Because he has not turned his back on us. He is holding us through. And, and you know, uh, the, one of my favorite poems is, is Footprints in the Sand. And I, I love the idea that there were times in my life where God carried me. There are also times in my life where he drugged me kicking and screaming. Okay? But, but I love the idea that when things were at their worst in my life, God was right there. 
okay? And I don't have to give thanks in, oh, great, another kidney stone. <clears throat> thanks, God. But I can give thanks that he is sustaining me, that he is holding me. And should what we consider the worst happen, and he take me home, really, is that the worst? Isn't that the goal? Isn't that what we're desiring for? Isn't that what we want? I mean, yeah, those that are left behind, they were separated for a time. Okay? But our hope is for what is coming. We live in this hope now, but we receive it then. Okay? We know because he has said it to be true, but we wait in this life to receive it in the next. So give thanks in all things? Yeah. He's worthy of it. So this season, what are we going to give thanks for? Everything. Okay, so what are you not going to give thanks for? Nothing. <clears throat> we need to soak this into our bodies, folks, because all too often on Thanksgiving, we... we and, and I know everybody has different traditions, uh, different things that they do. But most of the day revolves around eating and being with people. And then, you know, there are other things that people do. I know a lot of people watch football on that day. Some of us play football on that day. We, we, every year we try and have our turkey bowl and the Van Lo family gets together and plays football. And it's a lot of fun because nobody's very good at it. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, and, and we play tackle. And it's that one time a year where I get to hit the kids as hard as I want. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't mostly catch them. <laughs> so, um, you know, but we have different traditions. But all too often, on this day that, that George Washington established, you understand that Thanksgiving was actually set up by George Washington on November 26th? as a day, if you have opportunity, um, do a little bit of research. Because George Washington, when he set this day up, he set it up as a day not to just be thankful, but to be thankful unto God for all that he had done and, and the ways that he had blessed this nation. And then Abraham Lincoln, and, and right there, I have just listed what I believe to be the two greatest presidents this country has ever had. He decided it is going to be the fourth Thursday of every month. And he reiterated, why are we doing this? Because God has blessed us. Okay? But we get so caught up in the day, um, I I'm thankful for a deep fried turkey. If you haven't had it, you're missing out. Let me know. I'll let you have some. Okay? I love deep fried turkey. Okay? I I'm thankful that on most Thanksgivings, most of my kids come together. Okay? I'm thankful that we get to have a day where we can laugh and have fun and everybody takes care of, of different parts of the, the food and the preparation and we play games and, and I'm thankful for those things. But if that's all I'm thankful for, haven't I missed the greatest thing of all to be thankful for? I mean, I have a relationship with the Almighty God. I have intimacy with the Creator of all things. I have dwelling inside me the triune God that, that loves me and is compassionate toward me and is forgiving toward me. And, and on this day I'm thanking Turkey. And, and, and when, when I look at it like that, it just seems kind of shallow to me. So, 169 times the Bible talks about being thankful and on this day that we choose to set aside to be thankful, to express our thanks, we oftentimes just turn it into something about us. And, and we celebrate us. And, and I, I just feel like we need to kind of Step back for a moment, look at the bigger picture, 
And then when we step forward, we carry that big, bigger picture with us, okay? So um, I, I want to talk about three things, about why, do we, why are we thankful, okay? Why are we thankful? Uh, if you have your Bibles open, um, turn over to 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 4. Most Bibles, 2 Corinthians, comes right after 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm actually going to start uh, in verse 13. And this is a, a, a beautiful passage. Uh, when you have some time, back up and read this entire passage. Uh, I'm, I'm picking up in verse 13. Uh, Paul is writing, he says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So, what we see here is that one of the driving motivations for sharing our witness, for evangelism, for testifying to other people is to increase the thanksgiving which honors God. Do you ever think about your thanks honoring God, bringing glory to His name? I mean, you know, we, we think about God and the Shekinah glory that he has. We think, well, how can we add to it? Well, we can add to it by being a people of thanksgiving. And, and how does that really work? Well, really, we're, what we're doing is we're showing more and more people something to be thankful about for him. So that, that glory is being shown into dark places and, and giving people a reason to be thankful for. Okay? So, so reason number one. Why are we thankful? Because it honors God. It glorifies His name. Okay? And, and honestly, I want to do that. I want my life to bring honor to Him. I want the things that I do, the things that I say, the things that I think, to be honoring to Him. Not to, to besmirch Him in any way. Okay? So, number one. We give thanks because it honors God. Okay. Now, uh, this, this next one, I've actually got several verses. We're going to hit them pretty quick. So if you don't get to them, come to me after service. I'll give you the references, okay? Um, reason number two. I, I actually read part of this this morning, Psalm 100. I'm going to flip over there real quick. Psalm 100, I'm going to read verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Now this is, this is not a, if you feel so inclined. This is a directive. Look, you, you come into the presence of God, come with thanksgiving. You know, it's like the fanfare that announces you. Okay? Remember back in the, the days of your where somebody, an important personage, would come in and they would blow the trumpet and they would announce, this is such and such of so and so and his wife. <laughs> and the thing that always amazed me whenever I see movies about this, nobody pays attention. They just keep going. But, but this is your fanfare coming into the presence of God. You come in with thanksgiving and his head turns and he looks at you. Okay? So... We come into his presence. It's directed. It's something that, that we, we announce ourselves to him with. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. This is actually one that we, we just touched on. Give thanks always. So um, you don't need to turn there. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, 
Colossians chapter 3, and um, I'm going to pick up in uh, verse 15. Again, this is Paul talking. So we already talked about in Thessalonians that we are to give thanks always. And in, in Thessalonians, actually, the, the part that follows that is because this is God's will for you. So here in Colossians, we're going to see the same thought, verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. Okay? And be thankful. Okay? These are directives, folks. Okay? These are not optional. Okay? We are being directed by God's word to be a people of thanksgiving, to be thankful. Okay? So, um, jumping down, uh, well, actually, I'll just read on down. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we got three verses, and there we're prompted to be thankful three times. Okay? Did you see, you kind of start to feel how important this is to God? Okay? Why do you suppose it's so important to God? We are uh, giving glory to God by being thankful. We're directed to be thankful. But why? Why? Well, what happens when we're not thankful? When we're not thankful? There's a, a couple of things that, that come to mind just right off the bat. When we're not thankful, we become conceited. We become prideful. We, we kind of get this idea that I did it. It's my success. And, and all of a sudden, as we grow ourselves, we diminish God. And that is sin, folks. That is one of the times that God says he will actively oppose you is when you live in pride. He will set himself against you. He will resist you. And trust me, you want to humble yourself before God rather than having him humble you before me. Okay? Because God has an incredible way of breaking you down. And he makes it stick. Going back earlier, I talked about Nebuchadnezzar. And he exalted himself. And it's amazing to me. And it, what's amazing to me is how much like him we are. Because God warned him, look, this is coming. Be careful. Don't do this. Or this is going to be the result. Gave him a dream. Gave him the interpretation for the dream. And he did it. Just like we would. And he exalted himself. He's looking at all the stuff that he built. Which God already told him. Uh, no. I used you to do that. It was me that accomplished this. I grew the tree that every bird came and roosted in. And the animals came and sheltered under. I did it. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, oh look what I did. And smack. God humbled him. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been humbled like him. I doubt any of you have been humbled in the same way, but I know a lot of us have been humbled because we, we exalted ourselves. James warns us not to exalt ourselves, to be prideful. It tells us to be humble before God. And, and then it makes an interesting note because right after that, what does it tell us? It tells us to resist the devil and he will flee. And I, I think those two thoughts have to be connected. I don't think James was just writing and, and then he went, oh yeah, and another thought. I think he was, it was a contiguous thought. Okay, so we're going to look in uh, Romans one twenty one, and I'm going to wrap this up. <coughs> Okay. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 21, where we're talking about uh, the downward spiral of, of moral depravity, okay? And, and there's one verse right here in the middle that I think is key. For although they knew God, who's they? Everyone, okay? They knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Okay, so here's the, the condition. This is what, what setting things forward. They knew him, but they didn't honor him or give him thanks. Okay? And then what happens? This is the follow. But they became futile in their thinking. Have you ever met somebody that was futile in their thinking? Well, if you watch the news, you have. Okay, I'm not saying that to be smart. Because a lot of what is shown on the news is done with the understanding of man in complete ignorance of God. Okay, and we look at these things that happen. Okay, uh, I get. I'll bet you if you watched any one of the major news <coughs> networks, I don't care, CNN, CNBC, Fox. I, I don't care which one. I will bet you you heard very little about God's plan in Paris. You heard about Allah's plan in Paris, but I bet you you didn't hear about God's plan in Paris. You see, this again, this did not take God by surprise. God is speeding things forward to the beginning. Okay, we, we say the end, but really it's not the end, it's the beginning. Okay, and so we're going to see these things happening more and more, more and more, more and more, like birth pains. As it progresses, they increase in frequency and intensity. Okay, so it's going to happen more and more. So, there are thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay? And, and we see this in the world today. We, we see it, look around in our culture, we see it in other cultures. It doesn't matter if they are separated from God, there's a darkening of their hearts. And, and the way that the people go about doing things they reject God, and they, they don't think right, and they don't uh, have, have, have pure hearts, and, and they're dark. And, and this is all a result of not being thankful. We, we reject him, we deny him, we're not thankful for him, to him, and then our thinking becomes clouded and futile, and our hearts are darkened. And, and I, I'll warn you, this in measure progresses with Christians as well. Okay? Because as we are less and less thankful, we tend to become more and more grumbling. If you're not looking at things to be thankful for, you will fall into the trap of looking at things to grumble about. And, and as a people, we don't want to be grumblers because God has a heavy hand on how he deals with grumblers. Look at the children of Israel in the desert. Every time they would start to grumble, God would move. Sometimes he'd give them exactly what they want, wouldn't he? We want meat! I, honestly, it's the funniest thing in the world in school when one of the kids starts laughing when they drink milk and it comes out their nose. <laughs> All right? But I have never in my life seen anybody eat so much that the food came out their nose. I don't want to. So if you've had it happen, I don't want to see the pictures. <laughs> but God gave them what they wanted, didn't he? Sometimes he gave them something entirely different. Snakes. I'll tell you what, I'd rather see somebody with food coming out their nose than snakes crawling everywhere. Okay? Um, as Christians, we've got to be very careful. We have got to be a people of thanksgiving. It honors God. It is directed. It is a, a command to us. And it keeps us from falling into the trap of being less than we really are. Okay? So this Thanksgiving, we're going to set our hearts and our minds right. Instead of throwing in at the end of our prayer, thanks God, we're going to start there. We're going to start with thanking God, and we're going to go down from there. Okay? And, and 
So let's, let's establish our priorities correctly. Let's line them up. And I challenge you, write them down. Write them down. Every few years in our family, we, we make lists of what we're thankful for and, and we share it. Okay? But start there, write them down, and think about everything that God has blessed you with because you realize that everything you have, God has blessed you with. Right? Do you understand that? There's nothing that you have, there is no good thing that you have that God did not give you, James 1 tells us. Okay? In Corinthians, it tells us that you don't have anything but what God gave you. So don't boast as if you did it yourself. God gave it to you. Okay? So let's start with setting God first this Thanksgiving, this season. Okay? But don't, don't wait till the day of. Let's start right now. And let's become a people of thanksgiving. So that's the first thing that comes out of our mouth when people are asking us. So, you know, hey, man, I'm thankful. I'm, man, I'm thankful. I've got a God that has sustained me for 46 years. And there were a lot of times in that 46 years I didn't think he was going to, but he did. God has blessed me. I have intimacy with a God such as I have never known in my life, and it's just growing. I have a family that every one of my kids is serving God. And, and I tell you what, I thought that a long time ago, and God opened my eyes to, to realize just because they grow up in a Christian home doesn't mean they're Christians. There are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. It's the father and the children, and that's it. Okay? So you don't get to usher your kids in just because you're a, ki a Christian. So I'm thankful that he moved on them and he saved them, that the ones that are married, their spouses are serving him, that the grandchildren that they've given us, and I know sometimes they, they will, like, literally, can you just take them, please? <laughs> <laughs> Papa loves you, but it's time for bed. You can stay up and watch TV, I'm going to bed. I am thankful for all that, I'm thankful for this body that God has put together. Uh, you know, folks, if you have not been to other churches for a long time, you really don't understand what a blessing this fellowship is. And I, that's not to speak negatively about them, but God has done something here that I, I can't even really put into words, but it's incredible. The, the spirit that is in this place is, is just a huge blessing to me. Okay? So let's start there. We start with God, and then we go to all the stuff that he's given us, how he's blessed us. Amen? Amen? Father, we bless you today. And we thank you that you are so good. That you extend loving kindness to us. Father, that you have given grace. Father, you have given mercy. And Father, you've given us what we don't deserve. And Father, you have taken away what we did deserve. We thank you that your loving kindness is so great that you've made a way. Father, we thank you because you're just awesome. There is no other God. And you have invited us into an eternal relationship with you. You have welcomed us into intimacy with you. You show us how to be wise. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>